Okay, today is October 15, 2007 at the Circle Cinema here in Tulsa. And we're pleased to have Mr. Russell Burby of Tulsa, who was in the Army Air Force, reached the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, was in the 47th Wing, uh, the 50th Bomb Group. 450th. 450th, I beg your pardon. And the 723rd Bomb Squadron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burby, for joining us this evening. And I just asked if you would tell us uh, your story and your words. Okay, I guess we'd start off when uh, I entered the service. Uh, when I finished high school, it was uh, 42. And uh, I was pretty good in football. And uh, there was uh, a man in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, said that if uh, we wanted to go to college, you could get me a football scholarship at uh, Drake University in Des Moines. So uh, me and another kid went hitchhiked down to uh, Des Moines and got to Drake University and found out this guy couldn't give us a... And uh, so we hitchhiked back and uh, we stopped in Minneapolis and we went into the post office and we were looking for a service we might want to uh, go into. So we looked at the Navy and the Marines and the Coast Guards and this other guy said, I think we're going to go in the Air Force. And so we did. And so uh, we, uh, they told us to come back at a certain day to take a test. And then if you had two years of college, you didn't have to take the test. But if you just were in high school like me, you had to take this test. Well, most everyone failed it. And I think I was about the only one that, out of the 20 that passed the thing. And, and my friend also passed it. And uh, incidentally, he turned out to be a, a, a major general when he retired. And, uh, so uh, then we just went home, and all of a sudden we get a letter, and uh, they told us to report to Fort Snelling, Minnesota, and be sworn in. And so we were sworn in, and uh, they said, told us to go home again. And so I guess in December sometime we got another letter to report to uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, which was a real fiasco because they had because we thought we were aviation cadets, which meant you got $75 instead of 50 or 44. And uh, we found out we were aviation students, which seemed as a buck private, you know. But uh, so a anyhow, uh, there's 10,000 of these cadets that are down there, and they didn't expect us. So they had these Dallas huts, which were about 20 by 20, and they had put eight people in them. The only thing was there was no beds, there was no nothing. And so we had to walk over to a supply depot, get these beds, carry them, because they didn't have any trucks. But they didn't let us use them if they did. And then had to set them up in that night. And we had eight guys in, the, in there. So uh, after we graduated from Jefferson Barracks, which was kind of basic training, jumping up and doing side straddle hops and running in place and things like that, uh, they came out and said, uh, OK, uh, we're going to send you to uh, to school. So they sent me to uh, Creighton University. And uh, it depended on the, the test you take and uh, how long you're going to stay there. And at that time, uh, if you were one of the uh, upper, uh, had the upper grades, you stayed there about a month and a half. And you got about 10 hours of flight training in a, in a Piper Cub, I think. OK, and if you were average like I, you stayed about two and a half. And you didn't get any pilot training. And if you, other guys, they were third. You know. So I stayed there about two months. And actually, they didn't expect to see there because uh, the guy said, whatever you do when you get in this airplane, don't have a knife or any keys because it's going to affect the, uh, the, uh, you know, the mechanism. You know, and I thought, God, they got these big engines out here and all that stuff all made out of iron. And they're worried about a pocket knife, you know. Well, the guy was a, a Navy guy, that's how come he was telling me that, because you're probably right next to the, to a compass or something like that. So anyhow, we shipped out and uh, went to Ellington Field Air Force Base in uh, Houston, Texas, and uh, went through pre-flight. Stayed in pre-flight for a while, and then we were, uh, we were taking some more tests, and you qualified either as a pilot, navigator, or bombardier. And I qualified as a bombardier and a navigator, and uh, except there was schools open apparently in, uh, in bombing, 
And so we thought we were all going to go to some bombardier school. Well, it turned out those schools were full, too, so they sent us to a gunnery school in Laredo, Texas, and Eagle Pass, Texas. And we stayed there, and we uh, learned how to uh, take a 50 caliber machine gun apart, blindfolded with gloves on, and check the head space and all that. And it was just wonderful, because you shot skeet every day. You uh, shot the 50 caliber machine gun on top of a truck on a turret. And uh, it, it was, I, I thought I'd just as soon stay there as go on to any place. So anyhow, we, we shipped out of there. And you had to qualify in a, in a turret, either the Martin Upper Turret, the uh, Emerson Nose Turret, the Sperry Ball, Ball Turret, or the Consolidated uh, Tail Turret. Well, all of us guys had to qualify in the Martin you know, Turret. So, uh, that, so then we went to, uh, finally went back to uh, Ellington and uh, stayed there for a while and got some navigation training. Then we went to San Angelo, Texas and got bombing training. And we stayed there about 40 some weeks, maybe uh, yeah, about 40. And they gave us an extra six months, of, or six weeks of uh, navigation. And then, uh, then we shipped out and we were all brand new second lieutenants. And uh, I went to uh, Colorado Springs, Peterson Field, and uh, this was in March of 44. And uh, stayed at the Antlers Hotel and couldn't get out to Peterson Field on kind of the snow, so I stayed there a couple of days. And then uh, when we finally did go in, we were joined up by a crew, and uh, there was 10 of us, and uh, we were going to fly B-24s. Well, we stayed there a few months, and then uh, we were okay as a, as a crew, and they, they sh shipped us up to Lincoln, Nebraska, where we picked up a brand new B-24 and uh, flew it up to Bangor, Maine, and from Bangor, Maine down to the Azores and the Atlantic, and from the Azores we went into Marrakech, which was a, a nice restaurant, or a nice uh, hotel out in the middle of the desert. And when the Germans left, one thing they did, they broke all the water glasses. So if you wanted to drink, you got to drink out of a Coca-Cola bottle that was sawed off. And uh, so we stayed there a couple of days, and then we went to uh, Tunis. And at Tunis, uh, we just stayed there a short time, but the place was just full of airplanes. Uh, when Rommel was leaving Tunis in North Africa, uh, he had all these transports coming in to take these uh, soldiers out. And uh, it was easy picking for the Spitfires and whatever airplanes the U.S. was flying. And they shot down just all kinds of them, just slaughtered them, you know. So then we dumped the airplane off at uh, some place in Italy and we jumped into a, a, a truck called a 6x6. And they took us to a town, uh, took us to uh, our base. And uh, so once we got there, uh, they said, okay, there was a barracks that was half burnt down, and the Germans had done that too. And uh, so the, we divided up, and I got to stay with the co pilot, and the, and the navigator got to stay with the pilot. But when we walked into the room, there was nothing in it. There was no bed, there was no chairs, no nothing. Some guys had built a, out of a piece of plywood a wall and, and put a pipe through it to hang your clothes up. and. Uh, and that's what we had. and there was three forty fives laying on a on a kind of a desk on there. The, the crew I didn't take them with you, you know, you never took them with you. You'd get in trouble shooting somebody. And uh, so uh, the next day, Nick McCool and I, who was a co-pilot, uh, we scrounged some uh, lumber, got some webbing, because there was no mattresses or anything, and we made the, made these makeshift beds, and uh, we stayed there. And we then we started flying missions and. About the third mission, uh, we were flying, uh, we went into uh, Budapest, and we had about seven in the squadron, seven airplanes in the squadron bombing, and the flak was pretty heavy, and we didn't see any fighters. But uh, when it came out, after all the bombs were away and we made our turn, we only had four airplanes left. So we, we got back home. And uh, so by this time, I had about after that, he flew about 10 more missions, and one time they called us in the briefing, and uh, the arrow went straight east, and we thought, God, when it went over there? And, well, it was Romania, and it was the Ploestia oil fields, which the Germans, you got all their oil from. 
And uh, but so we went in there and bombed it. But uh, they always had smoke generators around these refineries. And there was right in this one area, there was probably six or seven refineries, a lot of refineries. But they all had these smoke generators, and you could never see your target. And by this time, radar wasn't that good. And then we called the radar operators, Mickey operators, and they could do fixed angle bombing, which wasn't precision bombing, but it would area bomb it, you know. So, uh, and so we lost a couple airplanes there too. And because they had about, I'd say, 400 anti aircraft guns around there, uh, the fighters never came in for some reason. They stayed out because we had, by this time, we had some P 38s that were flying around. And, uh, so any, anyhow, I flew uh, three of those missions to Ploesti, and we always came home with, with some damage. Uh, one time we came home and uh, we uh, had one engine shot out, and then another one, we were just coming over, getting ready to go over the Alps, and uh, a second engine cut out. And we just barely steamed over the top of those damn mountains. And I could look down, I was in the bomb bay because we were going to bail out. And we'd thrown everything out to lighten the road, the load. But I said, if anything happens, I'm going to follow one in one of those crevices, and they'll never find me, you know. So, but anyhow, we just you, when I was standing in the bomb bay, you could put your foot out, you could almost touch the top of those mountains. So, anyhow, came down and landed, uh, went down to the Adriatic and back their home base, and uh, uh, so, so uh, then uh, another time we were flying and my. And we were in the, in the fourth airplane in this uh, group of seven, and had one, two, three, and then the, the fourth airplane was behind the lead airplane, uh, but about maybe three or four hundred feet below. Well, when, when we got over the, where uh, what is now Aviano Air Force Base, Eugene down in that area, and over the Adriatic, the uh, gunner, one of the gunners in the in the lead airplane, the number one airplane up there, cleared his guns. And uh, the whole projectile, the whole shell, nothing exploded. It comes sailing through the air, hit Nick McCool right here. Hit him right in the side of the nose. And he was bleeding profusely, and he's hollering my name. So I got up there and banished him up the best I could. And, and we got home, and I stuck him in the hospital in Barrie. And uh, so I went up to see him, and I says, hey, Nick, I think you're going home, you know. He says, no, they told me I got to finish flying on this 50 missions. I says, Christ, this, we got a lot of extra guys now, you know. He says, but he says, no, he didn't. So, anyhow, to make a long story short, uh, uh, Nick stayed in the hospital, and I'd bring him some whiskey from uh, a rations at, uh, after every flight. We had old smugglers uh, scotch, and uh, you get about an ounce and a half, two ounces, I'd pour it into a canteen and get all the guys that didn't drink to go up there. And so when I went up to see him, I'd had give him about three-fourths of a canteen full of, full of booze, which helped him a bit, you know. So Nick finally come back, and uh, but this was December of 44, though, and uh, I was had 40 submissions already, and he was maybe down to 20 or 5 or so. And uh, so I said, Nick, I'm going to wait for you because we're going to go home and fly to B-26s together. We just had one navigator and bombardier and one pilot. And he said, that's fine, we'll do that. And so I told the squadron commander what I was going to do. He said, I don't care what you do, just tell me when you want to go home. You know, so I said... And, and, and what was, was, was 50 missions the magic number? What? Yeah. Okay. And so uh, anyhow, it was, uh, in, uh, it was a Christmas Day, December 25th, 1944. And Nick McCool was, was a co-pilot on this airplane, and they went up to bomb... Uh, Oh, uh, a choke point in the railroad marshaling yards, and of course it's way up in the mountains. It's like about you know nine, ten thousand feet those mountains, which means it's only fifteen hundred feet roughly, maybe two thousand, twenty thousand feet uh, uh, from the ground. You know, well Nick airplane got hit, and he turned around, and his pilot was knocked out. So somehow Nick pushed his pilot out, and somehow his parachute opened up. And uh, the guy apparently was safe. But Nick had half of his arm blown off. He bailed out and fell in the Po River and drowned. And that's what they called it. Why he died, he drowned. He would have died down halfway down, but he they, that's what they say, he drowned. And uh, then there was another time where we had a lieutenant colonel, which was rare. But this guy had been there a long time. And uh, 
It was a funny story because uh, next door to us was a kid named Harry Evans who was a bombardier navigator like me. And he came to me that day and he says, hey Russ, he says, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'm scheduled to fly tomorrow, but if you take my place, I'll give you 10 bucks. And I said, 10 bucks is a lot of money, you know, we're getting about $7 a day, you know, flying combat. And uh, so I thought about it, I said, no, nah, Harry, I'm not going to do it. Well, the next day Harry and his crew took off and they were going to bomb a bridge in Poland or someplace. And uh, all of a sudden the pilot looked back and there's fire in the bomb bay. And he says he didn't know why, but he slid a little door off the side, a window uh, on the side of the, uh, on his left side and crunched down in his flak suit and pulled his helmet, helmet down real big, just sat there and the airplane exploded killed nine guys, but he, next thing he remembered, he's floating down amidst pieces of airplane. And of course he was captured and uh, he, he came back, but uh, it was really something to see that, you know, an airplane exploded and blew him right out of the damn airplane. You know, that's what had happened. He just died about a year ago. And if you had taken the ten dollars, you would have been on that airplane? I would have been on that airplane, yeah, so I was glad I didn't take the ten bucks. Yeah. And, uh, Another thing, we, we never got any beer. We didn't have any beer or there was nothing. We had a BX in this town of Manduria, which was just a little Italian town down in southern Italy. And uh, you go in there in the BX and you could buy uh, cigarettes for six, you know, 60 cents a carton. Which, and uh, you couldn't spend a dollar unless you bought a Zippo lighter and that was about 80 cents. You know, you could buy a box of hard candy for six cents and a couple of razor blades and stuff. And I used to buy soap and give it to the houseboy that came in and he gave it to his grandpa, you know, so. But uh, anyhow, so uh, after uh, Nick died, I said, I might as well go home. So I got on a boat, uh, it was called, uh, it was the USS America, but during the war they changed the name. It was either USS America or US United States, one of those. But anyhow, they changed the name to USS West Point. And we, we came uh, out of Naples, and uh, it was cold as hell in Naples. And we stayed at a Termi hotel, and it was cold there. And, and this one friend of mine who was a pilot going home at the same time I was, he says, hey, he says, I found out how you can get warm. He says, they've got a, a warm uh, bath down here. And I said, I'll go on down there. Well, it was some water that was just hot, you know. And so I remember I felt great in the tub, and all of a sudden this great big guy comes in, lifts me out of the tub, and starts pounding on my back. And, and, I, and I got warm, but I never went back there. You know? and, and so then anyhow, uh, I got back to the States and uh, got close to Boston, and uh, they kept us out there for about two days. It was colder than the sun. And so uh, anyhow, so uh, I went uh, back to Duluth and uh, stayed there for two weeks or so, and then and they uh, told me to report to Santa Ana, California, and uh, which I did. And uh, it was supposed to be rest and relaxation, but they just had you go into schools and processing, you know. And so uh, anyhow, I was in the hospital there for a little bit, and, uh, and uh, we had one guy, his name was Kupsik, he had bed number one. He had 43 holes in him all over his body, and then another guy just was shot up, but nothing was wrong with me really. It, but it was also a, a place where you had uh, people that just cracked up, you know, and they just sit and stare in the place and, and hold a book but never turn a page, you know. It was kind of weird. And so anyhow, they uh, then I went to, back to a school, to Midland, Texas, I think, and they kept teaching us all the stuff that we already knew, you know. And so I finally said, I'm not going to stay here. And so they came up and they said they needed X combat members, crew members to volunteer. And they wanted 19 bombardier navigators, so I raised my hand. And they said, okay, you, what kind of airplane do you want to fly? And I said, B-26s. And they said, fine, we'll take care. Well, there's 19 of us guys there, and everyone wanted to fly a different airplane or go back to his old group and fly the airplane or something. The guy finally, he just, there was no way he could solve it for everybody. So he says, you're all going to B-29s. And so we went to El Magado, New Mexico. And so I, I was, uh, we were flying a mission, uh, I was on a crew, and uh, we were flying a mission, and we seen this big explosion, and that was when the first atomic bomb was set off, you know, at El Margardo. And I says, I told the pilot, I said, what the hell's that? And he said, I think a depot blew up or something, you know. So 
uh, it was an atomic bomb that blew up. And uh, anyhow, we, we came back there. And then in August of uh, 1945, uh, I was sitting at the bar, and some guy says, hey, they dropped an atomic bomb on, Jer on uh, Japan. I didn't know what an atomic bomb was, neither did anybody else, you know. And anyhow, so uh, then the 9th of August, they dropped one on uh, Nagasaki. And then the war ended. When the war ended, no one flew. They didn't use one gallon of gas. You know, and to get your flight time, which was half of your base pay, you had to fly four hours. So I had a couple of adventures with them. And I, one time I was sitting up there, and they said, any navigators, bombardiers, radar operators, or gunners that need to fly in time, we've got a B-17 that's going to fly around the flagpole for four hours, you know. And so off I went, and, and uh, I ran down to base ops. I said, where's that B-17? I get my time, and the guy goes, there it is, it's taxiing out. He said, I'll give you a ride to the end of the runway. And the, the door to the B-17 was, was a door in the back, and so I climbed in, you know. And, and we took off, and I, I walked up there, and I talked to the pilots, and I says, you guys didn't give us much time to, uh, you know, get down here and get ready. He says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I announced it. We get our flying time, because the B-17's going to fly around here for four hours. He's on that airplane aboard it. He says, we're going to El Paso, Texas. So I, I had no clothes. I had a flight suit on, you know. So we went down there, and we stayed there. I went to the clothing sales, and for 3 to $12, you'd get shoes, socks, underwear, shirt, and pants, and belt, and, and you're in business, you know. And no one missed me. I, I went back. We went back, you know. And... Uh, and another time I was trying to get my flying time in a B-17, and we're at Clovis, New Mexico now, and the pilots are shooting touch and goes. And it happened that we had a, a engineer who had flown uh, B-29s, and apparently in a B-29, after the gear was down, you, you didn't have to go back and crank it a couple of times to make it sure it locked. But this guy, whatever, whatever it was, uh, they decided they didn't have to do that. So all of a sudden, I'm laying up on the table up in the nose of this B-17, sunning myself, and the airplane touches down, and all of a sudden, it starts screaming, get up, and the damn gear came back up, you know. And so I jumped up and got out the uh, hatch up on the top, and uh, and they clasped 26 the airplane, which meant it was completely bad. And uh, so from there on, then I... Uh, I was standing around. Well, we never, never had to do anything. All the officers would do, we'd get up in the morning, go over, have breakfast, come back, get into our uh, bathing trunks, go lay around the pool, stay there all day, get lunch there. About not four or five o'clock, we'd go clean up, go to the club, have a couple of drinks. Next day, do the same thing, you know. It was just a great life because the officers weren't supposed to work. And finally, some guy said, this is bull. You guys got to do something, you know. And uh, so they took some of the guys, made a maintenance, and some of the guys in supply. They put me in supply, and I had not, knew nothing about it. And uh, so I went down to see the guy that was running. And he says, Geez, we don't need anybody. He says, I don't know what the hell to tell you. He says, just hang around. You want a desk? We'll put a desk in. I said, no, that's OK. I'll stay out in the warehouse. And uh, so I stayed out there, and there was a sergeant there. And uh, he knew what he was doing, and uh, we had German prisoners of war still. They hadn't gone home yet, and, and they loved it. You know, they, they was always tearing open cartons of, uh, you know, fruit of some kind, you know. But they did a good job, you know, in that. So uh, all of a sudden, someone calls me personnel and says, hey, they're going to kick a lot of guys out of the service. They don't need them anymore, you know. So if you want to stay in, they've got a couple of places you can go. You can go to the Philippines or you can go to Okinawa. I said, I'll go to the Philippines. And so I went to the Philippines and stayed there, just got there. And uh, and the ninth bomb group was there in the first bomb squadron. Well, most of the people had gone home, and so out of this one group of, uh, let's say, 45 airplanes or 45 crews, there was only one or two complete crews. And I was on one of those, you know. Well, then they came up with a Project Sunset, and all the B-29s went back to the States. So then I had nothing. About that time, I get a phone call, and they tell me, uh, hey, you've got the MOS of a sales officer, and the guy that's uh, running the commissary clothing sales store and gasoline sales is going back to the States because he's Chinese, and his wife is white, and uh, she's going to leave if he don't come home. So, 
And I said, yeah, I don't know how I got that MOS, but I sure don't deserve it because I'm not going to do this, you know, because I don't know what I'm doing. And in about three days, they convinced me that I could do it, you know. So I ran the clothing, I ran the commissary, which was in a World War II uh, prisoner of war camp, and uh, the clothing sales and the gasoline sales. Gasoline sales was a barrel or a drum, 60-gallon drum. You had to buy five gallons at a time, and some of the people had Jeeps. Most of the dependents hadn't started coming over yet. So anyhow, uh, about there was a two-star general there that uh, liked me, and so he said, uh, when are you supposed to go home? And I said, I was supposed to go home about a month ago. And he says, uh, he says well, uh, how come you didn't go home? And I said, well, I didn't find anybody with that MOS. And so he says, the next guy that comes down this field is your replacement. It so happened the guy was a comm officer. So the kid comes up and says, it's a big mistake, you know. About three days he bought the, <laughs> the commissary, the sick clothing sales, and the gasoline sales, you know. And I went back to the States, uh, I went to Houston where this general was going to be. Never seen him again after that. But anyhow, that, that was about the story of my 